Okay, so welcome to your Kick the Sugar Habit presentation, Kick Your Sugar Habit Workshop. I am Ellie Rome. If you don't know me, I am a certified health and emotional eating coach. I coach people with sugar addiction. I myself had sugar addiction, and I'm going to dive deep into that tonight. But before we begin, I love starting off with a tool that has been so profound for so many of my clients, for myself, and it is a way to regulate your breath and your nervous system. So a lot of times throughout the day, we can be stressed or running places and really lose presence. So this is a chance to ground and to be able to fully be here for this presentation, for this workshop, so that you get the most out of it. So I want to teach you this tool, and it's so helpful for cravings. If you have a craving for sugar, especially at night, so often it's because we've been stressed all day, we finally get home, and it's like, oh my gosh, let me go unload on the pantry. And so having this breath tool is a way to come to your breath in those moments before reaching impulsively for food. Okay, so this is called the five, five, seven breath. And what we do here is a five second inhale, a five second hold, and a seven second exhale. And the reason it's so effective is it teaches our nervous system. If we're in a stressed out state, when we're breathing this way with these elongated exhales, we're telling our nervous system, I'm calm. I'm in a calm state. We're safe. You can calm down and the body calms down. And then we're not agitated or stressed reaching for food. So five, five, seven, and we're going to do that together. So if you're willing, if you can find a comfortable seat, just sit with a tall, straight spine. And I invite you to close your eyes or find a soft gaze. And let your shoulders melt down your back. See if you can relax the muscles in your face and your jaw. And just start to tune into your breath. Feeling the rise of your inhale. And big exhale, feeling your belly fall. Just slowing everything down from your day. And on your next breath, we're gonna take a breath in, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, five, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, inhale, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, five, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, inhale, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, five, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, inhale, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, five, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven, inhale, two, three, four, five, hold, two, three, four, five, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can slowly release the count. Just come back into your natural rhythm of breath. Begin to feel for the earth beneath you. Supporting you. Taking a breath 
in, I am. Exhale, here now. Breathe in, I am. Exhale, here now. When you feel ready, you can gently flutter your eyes back open and reconnect to the world around you. Hmm. Thank you so much for going through that and your willingness to try that if you're able to. And again, this is a tool. Our breath is so powerful. And sometimes that's all we need is just a little space and breath and it can override so many impulses, so much of the compulsive need to eat. It's really just regulating our nervous system. So if anything, if you can take that from this presentation or from this workshop is to connect with your breath. So with that, we're gonna go in, begin. So real quick about me. So if any of you are new to the work that I do, so I'm again, Ellie. I was a former chemical engineer and I was a complete sugar addict my whole life from till age about 23 sugar was my everything and it really didn't catch up with me till college when I started to gain weight I gained about 30 pounds in college I started developing thyroid issues autoimmune issues I was this hyperactive kid who could not sit still and then I became someone who didn't want to get out of bed in the morning everything felt so hard I was so fatigued and I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what was happening. And I, I did know, however, I was completely out of control when it came to eating. I would try to do restrictive dieting. I would try to force myself into like almost starvation and like hard workouts. And then that would lead to like, I could do that for like a week and then it would lead to a deep binge and shame and guilt. And so I ended up going to six different doctors asking for help. And none of them could really find anything wrong. But I knew I was having all these issues. I was having eczema. I had shortness of breath. I was losing hair. And it wasn't until I went to a holistic practitioner and she was the only one that asked me what I was eating. Like I'd gone to a gastroenterologist. I had all these gut issues and they never asked me what I was eating. And it seems so bizarre now looking back. And the holistic, holistic practitioner, she knew pretty much instantly that so many of the foods I was eating were driving the inflammation in my body, were driving these chronic illnesses and also driving the sugar addiction. And so long story short, I found out those food sensitivities. I started, I shifted and committed to eating like ancestral eating whole foods. And I'm telling you within 30 days, like my world changed. My, all my symptoms went away. I lost like 10 pounds that first month because of just inflammation going away. And it was the first time in my life that I did not crave sugar, which I did not know was humanly possible because I was someone who I would eat like whole bags of Hershey kisses in the night, or like I would eat icing with a spoon, like a jar. And so I just want to speak to like, it was, and it was like a nightly thing, a battle every night. So to get to this point where like, I didn't crave chocolate, like I didn't know that was humanly possible. And that was just the start. So that was like this spark in me, like what is going on? Like I just, like I got so much misinformation from these doctors and like I'm feeling so, so much better. So I dove into the research and I, and again, long story short, I ended up becoming a coach. I quit my engineering job to do coaching full time. And now it's been about eight years and I've coached hundreds of people through this, through sugar addiction and healing through nutrition. And a big piece that was missing as well, like even when I was eating healthy, I was still emotionally eating. I was still reaching for even healthy foods when I was stressed out, when I was sad, when I was lonely, when I was tired, when I was bored. It was like food was my safety blanket. That was, it made me feel good, even if it was healthy foods. And so that was the next step in the evolution was learning these mindfulness tools and realizing that I was using food to cope and it was unnecessary. And so developing mindfulness, developing ways to regulate my nervous system, like that breath we did changed everything. And that wasn't just with eating. It brought mindfulness into why am I in this job? Why am I, why are, am I hanging out with people who I don't feel good around? And, and it was just like, it opened up so much. Why am I reaching for this alcoholic drink? 
And so it was just so much more than food. It gave me, it gave me power over my life. It gave me feeling in charge. And I wasn't consumed with food all the time, which was such a distraction. And so with that, for this presentation or this workshop, my main objectives for you are to learn the bitter truth about sugar and why it is so addictive and what it's doing to our body that causes so many issues that you may not even be aware of. And then learning why that you may be craving sugar all the time and how to break through that. And then walking away, I hope that you walk away with it from this workshop feeling empowered and having the tools to truly take action, like not just to have some information that's nice for a couple of days, but to really feel empowered with tools to walk away and change your behaviors and to break through sugar cravings, break through those nighttime cravings. So with that, okay, so a lot of common misconceptions, and I know I fell into these so hard, was being told to eat less and move more, that that would like save everything, or to just count calories. Oh, you just need to count your calories and that's how you lose weight or to avoid fat. We've been preached that fat is bad. That's the culprit for all these health issues. We've also been told that we can exercise our way out of an unhealthy diet. And that is just not the case. These don't work long-term. And the reason is that food, nutrition is information. Food and nutrition is, is literally your life force, your energy. And learning to see that, that like, what am I putting in my body? Like, this is literally affecting my mood it's affecting how I show up with my family members I know for me if I was like in a sugar crash or I had just had a binge like I don't want to be around anyone I don't want to be social feeling not good in my clothes like it just it steals away life force and when you're feeling inflamed and and it, it affects so much of mental health you feel anxious depressed like so much of that is blood sugar regulation and so realizing and really connecting that food is your energy food is your quality of life and starting to look at like every bite you take, like, am I nourishing myself or am I harming myself? And what you eat directly impacts like your aging process. Like, do you want to feel good when you're older and be able to play with your grandkids or it's being, you know, and it's like a harsh truth, but so many people, and I'm going to speak to this with Alzheimer's, like that's so driven by, by sugar. And so like you get to choose your quality of life, which is awesome based on so much of like your nutrition and your lifestyle habits. And just a couple of facts for you that, that astound me every time I say them, two out of three people in the US are overweight or obese. So that means only one third of people are actually at a healthy, normal weight. And 88% of people, now it's actually the newest study came out, 92% of people are metabolically unhealthy. What does that mean? Metabolically unhealthy means that they don't meet the criteria, meaning they're either on blood pressure medication, they're taking medication for blood sugar regulation, they have an um, extended weight circumference, meaning they're overweight or obese, that they have blood pressure issues, cholesterol issues. And so if you don't meet any of those, you're, or if you meet those, you are metabolically unhealthy. And that's 88% of the US population. And so also 50% of people are pre-diabetic or type two diabetic. And about 80% don't even know that they are. And so a lot of times people have pre-diabetes and what we'll talk about later is insulin resistance. And that's what it's basically pre-pre-diabetes. And it, you don't just catch diabetes, you know, it's a, it's an evolution. And so what we want to do is make sure that we're catching it early. So not developing type two diabetes. And as well with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's is a an absolute epidemic and it's increased it's increased dramatically over the last 30 years and alzheimer's being termed as type 3 diabetes it's essentially insulin resistance of the brain and a lot of inflammation in the brain and your risk of developing alzheimer's is quadrupled if you have diabetes so also cognitive decline does it happens decades before a diagnosis. So as I mentioned with diabetes, don't just catch diabetes. We don't just get Alzheimer's. That inflammation, that brain degradation, the cognitive decline is happening years and years. Brain fog, feeling fuzzy, forgetting things. Like that's happening well before a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, which means these are cues from our body. Like, hey, alarm bells, please pay attention. Like things are happening. And to use that as motivation to see food as your medicine. Like you can literally like see your food, like every bite you take, this is my medicine. And just to hit this 
this point home, one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. It kills more than people than cancer does, prostate and breast cancer combined. But the good news is that diabetes, obesity-related illness, these most cases of Alzheimer's, a lot of them are preventable and reversible with lifestyle habits. And that's what we're going to teach today. So how did all this happen though? Like we are spending as a nation, like billions, actually, I think trillions of dollars on healthcare. We are spending there. I looked up a stat today, $3.2 billion on the diet industry and the weight loss industry. However, even with all that money being funneled there, obesity is skyrocketing. Diabetes is skyrocketing. And so is obesity related illness. And so why is this all happening? And it's in the last like 50 years. And what has happened is that our diet has had an onslaught of sugar, refined carbs, high fructose corn syrup. So in 1970s, high fructose corn syrup was created. And it, um, let me back up. In the 19, around the 1950s, President Eisenhower had a heart attack and they deemed fat to be the culprit. And so they started stripping fat from food and that made the food taste like cardboard. So what do they do? They started adding sugar started adding sugar, started adding more carbs. And at this, at around the 1970s, they created high fructose corn syrup, which is metabolically very the same as like refined sugar. It's one glucose, one fructose molecule. The reason it was so detrimental to our health is it was so cheap to produce. So they started putting it into everything. And then on top of that processed seed oils, which we won't get into too much today, but these are another reason for insulin resistance for the massive amount of inflammation so many of us are carrying. And what happens with sugar? Okay, so this is something I feel like is so important to understand. When you're eating sugar or just refined carbs, so this is things like, it's not necessarily something sugary, but it's things like, like a vegan burrito, that tortilla, what is it made of? Usually refined flour and or some refined grain. And what happens when we eat that is our blood sugar spikes up to the top of a roller coaster. And at that top of the roller coaster, this state of having high blood sugar, that's toxic to the body. So the body has a protector, a protector, our insulin is a hormone that one of its duties is to take sugar from the blood and deliver it to our cells to bring our blood sugar back into balance. And when it does that though, if we get a huge onslaught of sugar, we get this huge spike from eating a bunch of carbs, our blood sugar rises, we get a huge surge of insulin, and that insulin doesn't bring our blood sugar just to balance. It brings it way down to the bottom of this roller coaster. And that's when we experience a sugar crash. Have you all ever experienced a sugar crash? Lori, have you ever experienced a sugar crash? Yeah. Yeah. And it's miserable, irritable. I know for me, feeling irritable, cranky. And what do we crave at the bottom of a sugar crash? Sugar. sugar. Yeah. Sugar, more carbs. And then what happens? We go eat that, our blood sugar spikes, insulin comes out, and then we crash again. And it's on this roller coaster all day long. And that's why so, y'all mentioned the nighttime craving. So often it's starting at in the morning, eating carby things in the morning, eating, getting our blood sugar up. Then at night we're on roller coaster all day or we're stressed or our cortisol's high from being too, maybe having a lot of things going on. And then at night we're crashing and just craving relentlessly, craving sugar. And there's a little more to this than what's happening. So also, as I mentioned, when we get these huge surges of insulin, okay, so insulin is our fat storage hormone. When that insulin comes out to take the sugar in the blood and deliver it to our cells, it can go to one of four places, our liver, our muscles, our brain, and our fat cells, where liver and muscles and brain are very limited storage. So they fill up pretty quick unless you have like a ton of muscle. So gaining more muscle is also a way to, to be able to have a little bit more carbs and sugar because your body can hold more. However, the rest is being stored as fat, fat. So eating sugar, storing it as fat. And when insulin is high, it's keeping our body in a fat storage state, meaning we can't burn our fat stores for energy. So even between meals, when you think like you should, you just ate, maybe you should like, you don't really need more food. If your body's unable to burn your fat, you're going to be reaching for more food to just satiate hunger because you're not being able to burn what's stored. 
And when insulin is also, when insulin is down, when we eat in regular blood sugar, then we can burn our fat for fuel. And then another thing that happens when insulin is high, so if we're eating a lot of carbs, if we're eating a high sugar diet, we get these chronically high insulin levels. We start developing insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is when if we are trying to force sugar into our fat cells and we're just eating too much and our body is basically becoming intolerant to carbs and it's, there's not enough room, there's not enough room to take on anymore. And so the body starts resisting insulin. It's like insulin's we're pumping out more and more insulin to get the cells to open up. And the cells are like, no, we don't need any more. So we have to get more and more insulin pumped out to get those cells to open up. Eventually we get to a place where our body can't produce enough insulin and our blood sugar rises. And that's when we have to go to the doctor and get type two, or we diagnose with type two diabetes and get insulin shots. But if you can think about this, and I love the analogy of this suitcase. So in with the suitcase, the imagine your suitcase is your cells, the clothes are like sugar and carbs and you forcing the clothes into the suitcase is like insulin's job. It's like forcing. So if you just keep packing more and more clothes, aka more and more, eating more and more sugar and carbs, eventually you got to get that extra insulin to get the suitcase to close. But the answer is not like what, what the medical paradigm is doing is just pumping people with insulin. But the answer is not more insulin. The answer is removing the clothes. Like don't pack any more clothes because you can't handle it right now. And so that's the, the sugar and carbs and not to demonize sugar and carbs are not bad, but they are we all have a different tolerance level based on where we're at in our health journey. And some of us have just, our body's in a state where it just can't handle as much right now. And so it's getting your insulin down by getting your carbohydrates down or pairing them. And I'm going to mention this later, like pairing them with proteins and fats to help keep our blood sugar regulated. So we're not getting huge surges of insulin that we don't have a ton of up our high blood sugar that we're having to force into cells. And this is so inflammatory to the body when this happens, when blood sugar is chronically high, when insulin is chronically high, because if you can imagine your cells are like bursting, this is causing inflammation. This is why so many people with type two diabetes end up blind or with neuropathy, they're getting numbness or end up getting amputations. And five out of six of every amputation occurs from diabetes that happen in the hospitals. Amputees are majority of them are just diabetic. And what's so sad, as I mentioned, is, is this uh, most of the cases are preventable. And a little more to this kind of like the hormonal story, and then we're going to get into tips. So I thank you for um, for staying with this. So hormone, our last hormone we're going to talk about is leptin. Leptin is our satiety hormone, meaning when we eat a meal, our leptin goes up and it tells our brain, hey, brain, we just ate. And the brain's like, okay, great. So I'm going to shut off your hunger hormones because we don't need to eat anymore. And I'm going to rev up your metabolism. So you go burn that energy. And then between a meal, we start burning that energy and that leptin signal falls down. And then we get to a point, the brain loses that leptin signal. And it's like, oh, we need food. I'm going to rev up your hunger hormones so that you go find food. And I'm going to slow your metabolism so that you can serve energy. Because evolutionarily, evolutionarily, if we were in a starvation state and we weren't having food, we wouldn't want to be going running marathons and burning a bunch of energy. So slow metabolism, let's conserve as much as we can and maybe feeling a little sluggish and tired. And then going, eating a meal, leptin goes up, brain's like, cool, we're full, I'm gonna rev up your metabolism. And that's the natural healthy cycle. What happens though, when our insulin is chronically high and insulin's elevated, the brain cannot see leptin. It blocks the leptin signal. So even if you've just eaten something, you just had a meal, but your insulin is high, your brain doesn't get it. It doesn't know that you're full. So you just overeat, keep eating. I know for myself, I would, we'd go to like an Italian restaurant and I would get a huge bowl of pasta and like eat so much food, be so physically full. But then we'd get home and I'd be looking for cookies in the pantry. And I just never, I remember telling my mom, like I never felt mentally satiated from food. I could feel physically full, but it was like, I could just always keep eating. And now understanding the biochemistry of it, of this is what was happening. My, I was eating things that were just, my insulin was so high and just chronically hungry, not to mention just the dopamine from a lot of the, the sugar and carby foods as well, but these hormones. And what's sad is that a lot of people who are overweight or obese, 
they are deemed as, oh, like being fat and lazy or like gluttons and sloths. But in reality, this is the hormones are driving the behavior. So like I mentioned, the, the insulin being the fat storage. So your body's literally just in this like storing fat, storing fat, storing fat. You're on a blood sugar roller coaster. So you're craving sugar all the time and keeping your insulin high. And then on top of that, leptin not being seen. So you're just hungry all the time and your metabolism super low, feeling super sluggish. And all you want to do is eat. And, and the conventional wisdom is just to eat less and move more. But if your body's in a starvation state, it thinks you're starving. Like the last thing you want to do is just eat less and move more because your body's absolutely resisting that. So a lot of times people, you know, can starve themselves for like two weeks, but then it backfires and end up having a binge and then falling back off track. So I kind of just recap this, but sugar puts you on a blood sugar roller coaster, keeps you in fat storage mode and blocks satiety signals and slows metabolism, leaving us feeling hungry and tired all the time. And if y'all have any questions during this, if anything is confusing or you just want to ask or speak up, um, please feel free to unmute yourselves or you can always drop something in the chat. All right. So you may be thinking, well, I don't eat that much sugar. And I just want to reiterate that this is not just about sh like sugar, sugar, like white sugar, table sugar, candy, soda, cupcakes. This is about foods that are filled with refined carbs or filled with with low protein, low fiber, no fat, that basically just jack your blood sugar up as if you were eating candy, like the vegan burrito I mentioned, or things like tortillas, oatmeal, um, a lot of like healthy seeming foods that actually may be jacking your blood sugar up. And there are hidden sources of sugar everywhere. So there's so much clever marketing. And this is something I really want from you to take from this presentation is to really be aware of that marketing. So I'm going to show you this meal comparison. Okay. So say you had a really rough day and you didn't prepare breakfast. So you go to work and you eat a donut and have an eight ounce cup of Coke for breakfast. And then you have a snack. You just grab a Snickers bar. You eat McDonald's burger and fries for lunch with an eight ounce cup of Coke. And then you don't even eat dinner. You just like go to bed with a cup of one cup of vanilla ice cream and two chips ahoy cookies. Okay, that is 140 grams of sugar. Okay, so the next day you're like, I'm gonna do great. I'm gonna do so much better because yesterday was a really bad day. So breakfast, you have a strawberry yogurt, um, Chobani organic yogurt, and a small bowl of raisin bran with skim milk, and then eight ounces of orange juice. Then for a snack, you have an Atrial Valley granola bar, for lunch, you have a salad with fat-free dressing, two tablespoons of fat-free dressing. Then you have a little coffee mate thing in your coffee. And then at dinner, you eat whole wheat pasta with ragu, salt, red sauce, and some iced tea. So that's 144 grams of sugar. And the reason I share this is because so many of these foods on the market are so commonly deemed as healthy and in reality are like just as much sugar as eating all of this quote unquote like garbage. And the American Heart Association, so they recommend 24 grams of sugar per added sugar per day for a woman and 36 grams per day for a man. So what I just showed you, it was five times the limit for a woman and four times that for a man. I think that Chobani yogurt was actually like, you'd be at the limit for a woman or even that one glass of orange juice one eight ounce is about 26 grams of sugar. And the thing is when it's, you know, you can imagine eating six oranges, you're getting all that fiber. You're getting that fiber to slow blood sugar absorption down. So if you can imagine eating six oranges, like you'd be full and you wouldn't really want to eat anything. But when we juice it, we're stripping all the fiber and we're condensing the sugar and we're just getting a huge blood sugar spike from that orange juice. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to like demonize sugar. Sugar is not bad, but it treat it like a recreational drug. Sugar is addictive. Sugar in nature was a sign that something was safe to eat. It was a sign also of like good, like quick calories, but we have just absolutely hijacked that 
And as cavemen, we were eating on average 22 teaspoons of sugar per year. Now we're eating about 22 teaspoons per day on average. And sugar, I mean, it's hard. It's not like cigarettes or a drug where you can kind of like keep it out of sight, out of mind. Like we eat food multiple times a day. We are like, we have to make those choices multiple times a day. And there's so much conflicting information. There's so many, like I just showed you with like labels and, and foods that look healthy. So it's challenging. And just like with any addiction, there's withdrawal. So when you are in eating a lot of maybe more carby foods or in the depths of like just sugar cravings and eating things like that, there is a withdrawal period where it can be, it cannot feel very good the first couple of weeks when you cut it out, but then it is just, then it feels like so much lighter if you can get through that withdrawal period. But I did want to just mention- Oh, we have a, oh. We have a question in the chat too. Um, just wanted to hit you with that. Yeah. So Terry, so please explain added plus sugar versus sugar on labels. Well, I would consider it just, I would take their recommendation as just general sugar. Um, the reason it's added sugar, it doesn't include like, um, like the milk, like lactose sugar and milk. If it was like yogurt, um, it wouldn't include um, fruit sugar either as it, if it was whole fruit, if that makes sense. But for me, I think that's, and because sugar does have, like fruit does have fiber to help slow down the absorption. But if you're someone with diabetes, if you're someone that is insulin resistant the sugar in fruit is still sugar and so eating you know it's definitely better like absolutely reach for that in whole fruit um because it is packaged with nutrients it's packaged with fiber however it's still to be mindful that that is sugar um so eating like 20 bananas and you're on a um and you're on and you're insulin resistant like your body still is can have a hard time tolerating that and, but it can be such a great tool. Like I don't want to demonize fruit at all. It's just to be mindful of how much is in it. Um, I know for my sugar addiction path, like the first two weeks I ended up like, this is like nine years ago. I did committed to a whole 30, which if you haven't heard of that, it's like 30 days of very um, whole foods diet. Yes. Yeah. And um, the first two weeks, I was just like eating so many bananas. I was eating, I was roasting them with cinnamon. Well, I didn't make it through my first 24 hours of my whole 30. I ended up binging on a box of gluten-free brownies. And then I tried again and I made it those 30 days and, and they changed my world. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so fruit is so good as something to reach for, especially in the weaning period um, and just committing to the, the whole foods. Um, but I hope, does that answer your question, Terry? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Okay. So now I want to give you some strategies so that you can kick your sugar habit and like pra the practical tools part. We did the kind of the background and now moving into actual application. So how to kick your sugar cravings. Number one, to focus on what to add in. What focus on, it can be really easy to like, oh, I need to cut all this out. But if you can just like Focus first, what can you add in to help regulate your blood sugar, help you feel full, get those to get your insulin down and get your satiation signals fulfilled, that you're eating enough so that you aren't craving things at night or craving things between meals. And so what to focus on to, in order to balance your blood sugar, number one thing is to make sure you're eating protein at every, every time you're eating something, check, like, is there a check mark that there's protein there? And a lot of us are under eating protein. And this is so huge for satiation. So protein, if you like just to, to sources of protein would be absolutely like grass-fed meat, like best sources, grass-fed meat, free range eggs, things like um, chicken, turkey, um, you know, red meat, like that's been so deemed as such a, like a negative thing. And red meat has so much bioavailable nutrients and it's such a good source of protein. Um, things like fish, wild caught fatty fish things like nuts and seeds. Um, those are the kind of the overarching ways to get protein in. And then moving on to healthy fats. So fat has been so demonized, especially in like the slim fast era, all of that. And we need fat. Our brain is largely made up of fat and it's the healthy dietary fats that we eat. 
or it is made up of the dietary fats that we eat. So we want to be providing, I mean, our hormones, we need fats for our hormones to function. And so, and to feel full. So if we're not eating a ton of carbs, like fat is our other energy source, either we don't really make energy from protein. That's more building blocks. We can convert it to glucose if we're not getting enough glucose, but really our energy sources are carbs and fat. So fat hardly has any effect on insulin. If you eat fat and you watch your blood sugar or your blood insulin levels, like it stays pretty steady. Protein, you get kind of a little spike, sugar and carbs, like a really big spike. So eating healthy fats helps you stay satiated. It's an energy source and it helps keep your insulin low but not all fat is created equal. So we want to avoid fats like canola oil, vegetable oil, soybean oil, safflower, sunflower, um, rapeseed oil, things like hydrogenated oils, like the, can't believe it's not butter. Like avoid that, like the plague, even eating real butter is way better than eating um, hydrogenated, like the processed butter. Um, Ideally though, like the healthy fats to focus on eating are sustainable fats. These are fats that will stay stable even at like hot temperatures that they're not, a lot of the seed oils that are hyper-processed, they're, they're rancid on the shelf. So they're, their fat molecules are basically oxidized, which means that they are pro-inflammatory in your body and causing inflammation. They promote insulin resistance. And so they promote weight gain, they promote inflammation, they promote these chronic diseases. So the healthy fats are things like avocados, olive oil, coconut oil, the fat that's in grass-fed meat, ghee. So if you've heard of ghee, ghee is grass-fed clarified butter. And so they basically remove the milk solids so that if you have, you are um, sensitive to dairy, if you have a intolerance or food sensitivity to the casein protein in dairy, ghee is so great. And it's such a stable fat to cook with um, to feel satiated, to get energy from y'all heard of like bullet coffees. A lot of people put that in their coffee to feel just like brain power that would like MCT oil. Um, so these are your fats that you want to add in and incorporate in or the fats from nuts. So things like walnuts, pecans, almonds, um, the fats that you'd get from nuts are also a good source of fat. And then lastly, fiber. And I want to definitely speak to fiber because Fiber helps to slow the blood sugar absorption, like I mentioned with the oranges, the, like the whole fruit, that we're not getting a huge spike when we're eating whole fruit. And also fiber though, to not be seduced into marketing of like wheat and grains and cereals that are like fortified in fiber, like to focus on real sources of fiber, meaning from vegetables and from fruit from nuts and seeds have fiber as well. Avocados are a great source of fiber, but real food sources of fiber, not grains, not, not even beans, but more so focused on like vegetables. And a lot of times fiber, if you have gut issues, I won't go too far deep into this for this talk, but um, for gut issues, fiber can cause a lot of irritation. So to just pay attention to what, how you're eating it and maybe cooking down your vegetables more, if you feel like getting really gassy or bloated, um, that can be very helpful. Blueberries are such a great source of fiber and typically pretty easy to digest. Fruit is a lot easier to digest and, and blueberries are great because they're low glycemic, meaning they don't cause a huge blood sugar spike. So to first tip, focus on what to add, like checklist on your plate. Do I have protein? Do I have healthy fat? Do I have some fiber? And then if you are going to eat some carbs, like, are, and absolutely, like we need carbs too. Like I mean, especially as women, a lot of times it's just so helpful for our hormones. It's helpful for our cortisol levels. And so, but, and also again, noticing, knowing where you're at with your, if you're in a state of insulin resistance or pre-diabetic, diabetic, but for when you do eat carby things, just to make sure that you're pairing them with protein, with healthy fat, with fiber, um, at minimum protein for sure, um, to help, to help blunt that response and to help keep your blood sugar stable. And you'll just feel so much better, less cravings feel more satiated, feel like not as tempted to overeat because you get those satiation signals. All right, so the next tool, the next strategy to kick your sugar is to check your labels. So become a sugar sleuth, like anything that's in a package, like create a, a consistent routine for yourself of not eating anything unless you've checked the label on it. And because so much stuff is just so... It's just marketing. And so I'll show you some like vitamin water, 31 grams of sugar, 
31 grams of sugar from vitamin water is more than a Snickers bar. Then we have tonic water. That's a common one people aren't aware of. And tonic water has as much or more grams than a Butterfinger. These naked green juices are awful. They have so much sugar, 53 grams. That's greater than, more than a bag of Skittles. You could eat two Snickers bars for that naked drink. Then we've got things like yogurt. Like this looks like a healthy yogurt, but in reality, it's got more sugar than a pack of Starburst. Silk milk. I see this a lot with a lot of even like almond milk from Starbucks. Like that has 19 grams of sugar in the almond milk from Starbucks. This has more than a pixie stick. Even things like dried fruit. They're not bad. Like you can absolutely eat some dried fruit, but just to be so mindful of how much, because this one cup of raisins becomes 86 grams of sugar. That's so much sugar. And to know yourself. So another tip for you is to know what foods are also your foods with no breaks. So like caution foods, things that may even be healthy, like ra like raisins are definitely a healthier option. Or like for me, it's figs. Like I love figs. And so I have to, those are a caution food for me because they're so easy to overeat. And they're so delicious, especially when you're not eating a bunch of sugar. Things like healthier foods start becoming feeling like dessert. And so just learning mindfulness tools with yourself of like when you start to overeat something, like checking in and having some like boundaries with that. Maybe you have it once in a while. Maybe you portion it out prior, put it in little baggies so that you have some sort of, of regulation for yourself. Okay. Oh, I do want to share this. Okay. This is a common one I see too. Clients often come with me to like, there's so many things now like that are made with cauliflower or gluten-free and those like the cauliflower linguine, this one has 43 grams of carbs for, and only four grams of protein. So that's one, and that's only two ounces of the pasta. So if you ate, that's one sixth of the package. So say realistically eating a whole bowl, one third. So it'd be about 86 grams of sugar. I'm sorry, grams of carbs with very minimal protein. So what that does and is typically jack your blood sugar up. And a lot of times you'll notice they say like cauliflower pizza or cauliflower linguine, but the first or second ingredient is usually brown rice or some other grain. And it's just cauliflower's gotten this, like, it's kind of a trend. And so I, I see this a lot with like, oh, like go, if you go check out Oprah's pizza, her cauliflower pizza, it's like second ingredient, I think is brown rice and it's filled with carbs. And so just to really be mindful of labels like that. So checking not only the sugar grams, but checking the total carbohydrate and seeing how much protein and fiber are present. Okay. The next is simple swaps. So it can be really difficult on a health journey to, you know, give up all your favorite things, especially if you love sugar and you love just food. And so making lateral shifts can help really take out the overwhelm. And we are so lucky now in this day and age, there are tons of brands that are coming out with foods that have real food ingredients. They're mindful of the amount of sugar they're putting in and they are just such better up levels. So I like to tell people like one of my, my mantras is focus on like release perfection and focus on up leveling. So instead of thinking of a food, like, is this good or is this bad food choices on the spectrum zero to 10? So if earlier you were, you know, stressed out at night and ordering a pizza, okay, now could you could you find maybe like make your own or have like a cauliflower pizza that's a lower carb cauliflower pizza or like up leveling the scale. So maybe the DiGiorno is a two, the cauliflower pizza is like a six and in pairing that with some chicken, grilled chicken or like a rotisserie chicken you pick up at the store to at least provide that protein. Okay, we're bumping up to a seven. It's like really moving that needle up versus the perfectionism of like, well, if I can't eat a 10, then why bother? Let me just go get McDonald's. So every choice you can like, how can I up level this? How can I add in some protein? How could I maybe take the bun off and like go to McDonald's? So the McDonald's bun and burger and fries is a one. You take the bun off, you eat the patty and you get a side salad instead. Like, okay, we just got up to a six. So it's just like helping yourself focus on that. Like just how can I up level this? And with the simple swaps. So, so I'm going to share with you some of my favorite simple swaps. And I actually have a guide like with a bunch of simple swaps on them that I'll I'll send you guys after the presentation. But um, things like noodles, so whole wheat pasta, even the 
even like the chickpea pasta like that it's still like if you're struggling with sugar cravings and carbs those are still very carby so things swapping to zucchini spirals or my favorite thing now is a palmini noodles they're hearts of palm pasta they're amazing they're only like four grams of net carbs and they're a lot sturdier noodle than the veggie noodles and so like swapping to that and they're so easy you literally can eat them like straight out the package or just boil them like you would a normal noodle other things are like dark chocolate. If you love dark, like candy or dark or chocolate, like just to up level to that dark chocolate, I recommend 70% or greater cacao content. And usually that means it's dairy free as well, which is awesome. And just the higher the cacao content, the lower the sugar. Also like, okay, for ice cream, instead of Bluebell, can you get, they have so delicious dairy free coconut milk, unsweetened ice cream. And it's delicious. And this is one of my caution foods because it's still I, it tastes so good. Um, so it's just great in the moment though. If you are going to go, if you're like, just are going to go indulge on some ice cream, like, can you up-level it? And, um, and even this is a good example too, because they've got other flavors. They have like the, the regular ones that have a ton of added sugar. So these turquoise labels, it's just something to always be mindful of, of like checking the labels, no matter the brand. For baking, swapping white flour, refined flour for almond flour for coconut flour that have a lot more protein that are gluten-free that aren't going to drive inflammation that have healthy fats as well and aren't just straight carbs things like dressings dressings are where a lot of hidden sugar come from especially fat-free dressings especially anything with like strawberry vinaigrette raspberry vinaigrette those are typically loaded with sugar and also to check for dressings i'll just drop this in here to most of them are made with canola oil or sunflower oil or safflower oil. And so to definitely look for ones, I love the Primal Kitchen brand. They are made with avocado oil or to make your own um, with olive oil base. I think it is like the best if you can do that for yourself. Even olive oil, lemon and pepper is so good. Um, so to try those or to try that. And Birch Bender, I showed these pancakes. They're amazing. It's like swapping of pancakes. These are paleo pancakes. They're made with coconut flour and almond flour and they're instant. You just add water. Like instead of Bisquick making the Birch Bender pancakes and you can add dark taco chips and blueberries and other things that commonly high of sugar added are things like peanut butter or almond butter just to check those labels. Justin's is a great brand and you even have to check Justin's because some of theirs have a lot of added sugar. Um, red sauces barbecue sauces, ketchup, and Primal Kitchen also has great brands of this and they're unsweetened and they taste delicious. Okay. So the last, this is, I think the most important slide on this whole workshop and it is often what the diet culture misses. I can tell you all day what to eat. I could give you the perfect meal plan and, and you'd be so set up, but when we are hit with emotions, or we are exhausted, or we are tired, our brain often reverts to our default mode network, which is, for many of us, reaching for food to cope. A lot of us have, I know for myself, that was a, that was something from a very young age developed, and a lot of it's watching parents, or just in culture, that food is used as reward. You know, you get an A, go get an ice cream. Oh, you break up with your boyfriend? Oh, eat a pint of ice cream to cope because you're sad. Like, let's go get cake on your birthday and things like that. So our mind associates all that. It's like all this reward, pleasure, comfort food, comfort food. There's a reason it's called that. It provides comfort. So when we're hit with an uncomfortable emotion, most of us have this habit pathway in our mind that is going, uh-oh, I don't want to feel this numb let me grab food and that could be just even the minor like the a little stress state and so it's really becoming aware of your habit patterns getting off autopilot and honestly the question that changed my life I think is am I actually hungry every time food was going to cross my lips am I actually hungry and not denying myself of the food if I wanted to eat it just getting curious, building that awareness. Why am I reaching for this right now? What just triggered me to run to the fridge? What just triggered me to like order chocolate on Instacart? And it's like, 
sitting in that. And so often for me, I know it was, I was an engineer at the time, super stressed out. And it was like, I would get a stressful email from my boss. And then my mom, it was just like, I want to eat while I'm working because I'm stressed out and it makes me feel better. And so the, how to navigate that, because it does make us feel better is to be able to learn how to sit in those uncomfortable emotions, trusting and knowing that they're going to pass. And this is why the practice of meditation, even if you think that you're awful at meditation or can't do meditation, like there's no such thing as being bad at meditation. Meditation is the practice of building awareness of building impulsive, impulsive control. And so when you sit in a meditation and you're watching your breath or you're just listening to something and then your mind's everywhere, it's all over the place. And it's like, it doesn't want to sit still or it wants to go grab something that you forgot. Like those are the moments you're practicing. That's your mental reps. It's like going to the gym for your mind. Oh, here's an impulse. I want to get up. I want to scratch my leg. I want to stop this meditation. Breath, ooh, come back. That translates when you are hit with a craving instead of that an impulse to go reach for it immediately and resolve that feeling or numb that feeling. Breath, can I sit with this? Can I watch it? It comes like a wave. It's gonna come, it's gonna peak and then it's gonna go away. So one thing that helped me so much was it's a tool called future projection where through mindfulness, through meditation was building this muscle of actually having space to future project. How will I feel after I eat this? And oh my gosh, it changed the way I looked at food because I, I could start associating that when I have a binge, it was stealing like hours from me because it wouldn't be just the binge. It would be these hours after of guilt, of feeling bloated and gross and then beating myself up. And it was like, I couldn't be present with anything else. So it was like connecting that feeling do I want to eat this bag of cookies at night and then feel like garbage and then not sleep well? That's going to affect my day tomorrow. And so it was like almost visualizing myself eating the cookies. Yes, this will feel great, but it's going to end in about 60 seconds. And then what? Oh, I'm going to feel lousy. Like, and then, and then not, not in a shameful way of I can't eat this or I shouldn't eat this. Oh, I'm bad if I eat this. It was releasing all of that. It was just the observation of what happens when I eat this. Oh, I feel like I'd feel horrible afterwards. Like, oh, I'm actually, I can consciously choose. Do I want, yeah, I could get like 60 seconds of great pleasure. But then after that, I don't want to feel bloated. I don't want to feel bad. Like I, I want to feel good in my body. I want to feel energized. And then once you start doing that and practicing that, and you really do start feeling so good from the foods that you're eating. I remember after those 30 days, I was like, I will never go back. Like y'all, it's been, it's been nine years. I haven't had a piece of bread. I haven't had a, a binge like that on like a bag of Hershey kisses. Like, no, it was like, I don't, I felt so different in my body. It was like, I never want to go back to that. Yes. As I mentioned, I still emotionally ate like um, like healthy foods. And there were times I'd overeat and I would, that would be data for me. I'd be like, ugh, why'd I do that? And it would still happen. Yo, it still happens, but it's so far in between where it used to be like every night and it was on like deep sugar and I felt horrible. Then it stretched out and it was like, it would, then days would be between. And then it was months between. And then it was like, wow, I haven't eaten this in a year. And then eight years or like, so it just, it's not an all or none process. It's not a it's not all of a sudden you just never crave sugar again in your life or like you're never gonna have a binge in your life. It's just continuously learning and getting better and just developing this mindfulness muscle. And then sometimes we have phases in our life that things are going on, like life happens and we get stressed and we fall back into old patterns. We fall back into old coping mechanisms. This does not mean you failed. This means the data, stress came, you fell back into an old coping mechanism. It's like, in the mind, we have these super highways that get developed. I mentioned like hit a stress trigger and then go eat something, hit a stress trigger, go eat something. That's like been well-developed in your mind. So that is a super highway. The body's like, heck yes, let's take that. It's so easy. No energy required. And so building the new habit pathway, maybe for me, it was like stress trigger, grab a sparkling water and breathe. And then assess, do you really need to eat right now? And so that was the new habit pathway, stress, club soda stress club soda and eventually 
I get stressed and I'd be like, where's my sparkling water? Like that new habit pathway was formed, but it took a little time. And then that old one was still there. So when I get really stressed or like really overwhelmed, like I would want to reach for food, but then that became less and less. That one became kind of less easy to go to. And this new one, the sparkling water became like the new super highway. So I hope that makes sense. It's like finding those new tools to reach for, creating those new habit pathways. And that could be, you know, with the mindfulness, as you ask that question, am I actually hungry? What am I feeling in this moment? Oh, I'm feeling stressed. So what does that mean? I actually need food is one coping mechanism, but like the underlying root is like, I need a break. I need to like get outside and breathe. I need to call somebody. And so it's finding these non-edible forms of nourishment that are actually going to address the root of what you're feeling. If you're feeling sad, like, can you talk to somebody? Do you need a good cry? This is one reason I love breath work. Um, I'm a breathwork facilitator and this is not just like we did the five, five, seven. That's one form of breathing, like conscious breathing. But what I'm just referring to with breathwork is this really activated somatic breathwork, these deep, um, it's these deep journeys that we basically go on to allow emotions to come up to be released. Sometimes we just need to cry. And when we're not allowing that, a lot of times we're shoving it down with food. Um, so can, yeah, so creating the practice for yourself. Am I actually hungry? What am I actually feeling in this moment? And then seeing if you can, like a, like a loving mother to yourself, what can you give yourself in those moments? Like, what would you give your child who is, who is struggling with that? If they're crazy, like so overwhelmed, how would you treat that child? And it's with gentleness, developing self-compassion, developing that, that mothering towards yourself. The, a lot of times we can drop into the inner critic very quickly or shame or blame or be so hard on ourselves. And that just fuels more of the addiction that fuels more of the cravings, more of the wanting to numb. So with this practice of meditation, with these practices of mindfulness, it's building self-compassion. When you start going into a spiral of self-judgment, can you find breath and come back into that like mothering energy for yourself? Can you hold your emotions? Can you hold yourself? and speak kindly. And it's, I mean, it sounds so simple maybe, and actually it's pretty difficult in the moment, but it's a muscle. Self-compassion is a muscle and, but it is the most game-changing. It is so game-changing to not beat yourself up. And so to practice that, like, even if you do after this presentation, you go eat a bunch of sugar, like that is okay. Get curious. What is going on for you? What are you feeling? And, and nurture yourself, like speak kindly to yourself. What's going on? Um, so I hope that makes sense. And a couple other ways to build mindfulness with eating is really to slow down and savor your food. So removing distractions, getting your phone out. We'd only eat a couple times a day and it doesn't really take that long. So if you can gift yourself like five minutes, put your phone away, put your laptop away and just concentrate on your food. Let it be like this special thing, giving gratitude that you have food and that you are like, you are consciously nourishing your body. That is a form of self-love. That is a form of self-care. I am caring for myself by eating foods that are nutritious to my body that I'm worthy of. I am worthy of eating this. And honestly, in a, in a mega thing, it is the biggest act of service to the world for you to eat well, because that means you are showing up with presence. You are showing up with love with compassion for others. If you are inflamed and tired and, and in a sugar crash, like we are just not able to show up for our loved ones. We are not, and that's where someone cuts us off and it's like in a, in a sugar crash, it's like having no tolerance for that. And having, we're just, we don't show up in the giving way that our nature is, our, na our natural state of being is generous and loving and kind. And we lose that when we are, inflamed and addicted to sugar. So yeah, giving yourself a chance to slow down, to have time with your meals, listen to your body um, before eating. Am I actually hungry? Learning to regulate your hunger and, and your fullness, starting to develop. Like I didn't even know that I was just overeating. I mean, I felt feel so stuffed, but, but I was so unconscious during my eating where I was at on my fullness scale, creating pauses throughout your meal, you know, eating to a seven, on your fullness, a 10 being like, 
so bloated, you're gonna need to unbutton your pants to breathe. One being not full at all. You can do a seven where you're satiated, but you've got room. You're satiated from food, but you're not stuffed. And that's a practice of learning that about, where is this? Do I really need to keep eating? And yeah, so those are some eating tips. Absolutely encourage you to try. Even pick one meal that you're going to be like hyper present with and start there. And okay. So before we go into Q&A, I would love to share with you. So with, you know, if you're looking for more guidance, if you're looking for more support, I lead these 21-day resets. I've led them for years. And these are, in the past, have been live programs. And so now we've created a, an online course where all these trainings are in. It takes you through 21 days. 21 days is what I wish I would have had. This is like the combining, think of like the whole 30 in a very practical way that's very sustainable because whole 30 is great. It's amazing. However, for most people, like I've coached so many people that have done the whole 30, but have fallen back because it doesn't address the emotional piece or the, or really the sustainability piece, the simple swaps the up levels, like not being perfect, how to make this work. And that's what we do in these 21 days is really learning how to make this work as a lifestyle, easy, easy, how to dine out, how to travel, how to, how to handle food pushers at holidays. Like it's everything. And then really how to nourish yourself. So it's both the, that physical piece with like what foods are going to actually nourish your body, reduce inflammation, help you regulate your blood sugar the sustainability piece, how to make this work in your life, easy stuff, convenient stuff when you don't feel like cooking. And then the last piece is that this is, I think the most unique part of this is that it addresses the emotional piece, building the mindfulness, building how to regulate your nervous system, how to handle life when life happens and not lose it. And so if this calls to you, if you are looking for more support, looking for more guidance, and we have the trainings launching April 1st. So it's, a $247 course, but for the pre-launch and for anyone joining this webinar, it's only $99. And so you get access to everything and it is just, yeah, if you need that extra support, I just want to share that it is available and really excited to launch this. Um, and I want to open it up and say, thank you guys. Thank you so much for joining this webinar, this masterclass tonight. And I want to open it up for questions and actually, and speak to more of the nighttime cravings. If y'all are still feel like you need help with that. I just want to say, thank you. This is Terry. Um, I did do the whole 30 oh gosh, about two years ago and was very, very successful for about a year and then fell off <laughs> and um i really agree with the emo like i'm eating for emotions you know i'm eating my feelings away um and i guess i'm just curious at night if, if you experience that yourself what is a good go-to yes terry i'm so glad you asked and absolutely nighttime eating was my probably one of my biggest challenge too. I could go all day because I could busy myself. And then at night is like everything hit and all I wanted to do was eat. And so what helped so much was starting with, really it helps to like getting in the day, regulating your blood sugar. So making sure you're getting a really good protein rich breakfast, not spiking your blood sugar in the morning. So that could be like, for me, I love eating eggs. I mean, I'll eat like a burger in the morning, avocado, um, if you like want some carbs, like some, like a, some, a little bit of sweet potatoes, but pairing that with, um, or berries and pairing that with eggs or like, I love these like Adele sausages. They're super easy. Um, things like that. And then making sure at lunch also just like the meals are very satiating and are very protein rich. But then a lot of times it's also having times in your day. I call them pockets of presence and it's having times of day where you, like downtime, because I, I don't know how your schedule is, but for me, it was like, go, 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 go. I get home and I just wanted to completely like just relax. And food was a way food helps like calm my central nervous system. And so mm -hmm. it was like, but implementing times in your day where you just go sit outside it can be two minutes, five minutes, put your feet on the earth, breathe, just like five minutes of breathing, meditation, and having those like pockets of presence like to downregulate, like to just really like drop back in 
and then noticing, especially late afternoon, like before you get home, to have that some sort of like grounded practice so that at night, not eating out of stress or emotions. And then it's also things at night that can be super helpful too. Like if you are reaching for something is things like even like sipping on like bone broth at night or like an herbal tea, creating a new ritual with that, with that can be helpful. It's like giving yourself well, something. That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's also like, a, I like to give the begging dog analogy. So if every time at night, if you, if there's a habit now, right now, of sitting on the couch or sitting down and at night and eating, and I'm not projecting this on you, but just in general, like as an example, like say sitting on the couch every night and eating ice cream. And then what happens is if every night we're doing that or eating something sweet every night, it's like a begging dog. If all of a sudden after it's so conditioned to like want this sweet thing, and then all of a sudden you just like, you know, no, we're not going to have ice cream tonight or we're not going to have a treat tonight. And you've been giving this dog a treat every day. All of a sudden it's going to be like, what the heck? And it's going to claw at your leg and bark at you. Like that's our mind. All of a sudden you're not giving it ice cream. It's like, what? And it freaks out. And so those first couple of days can be difficult. And so really having like systems in place and recognizing like you're just retraining this dog, the wildness of your mind, the, the addiction of your mind. So it's like retraining this dog. You know, it's going to bark at you the first couple of days. So to help yourself by having temptation out of the house, having anything that's easy to reach for like out. So it's less available and then having things readily available that can satiate you. So even in those days, so maybe at night it's, eating just like if you are going to reach for food just that it's something without any sugar so it's or it's fruit um to like wean off any like nighttime munchies or sweets yeah so hope that's and then retraining the dog and then eventually it'll stop barking and your mind will stop begging you for those if Great, I, thank I, you. I could chime in on that too real quick um something that i really enjoy is frozen bananas it literally tastes like ice cream um which is a really cool dessert and is satiated by sugar cravings. So just wanted to put that out too. That sounds good. Um, I have a question, Ellie. Um, it's Renee. Um, hi. hi. So um, I have a couple questions. The first one is, what about intermittent eating or intermittent fasting? I, I saw a presentation on PBS a couple days ago, and he was saying pretty much everything you said, except he said something about like, have 12 to 14 hours, 16 hours in, you know, a, 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 as a time for not eating. And I know myself lately, I breakfast, I've never been a real breakfast person. Nothing ever sounds good. I'm not really hungry. And sometimes I'll force myself to eat an egg or something, but I'm really not hungry. And so I don't eat until about one o'clock, but then about nine o'clock at night, <laughs> I'm hungry and I, you know, and I don't like to eat a big meal or maybe not a big meal, but a meal that late. And I'm wondering what your take is on that. Yeah, Renee, such a good question. And intermittent fasting is so bio-individual. So it can be so great for people, especially with like who are super obese and, and diabetic and because it gives them a fasting window of where their insulin can come down. However, when you, for a lot of females, especially if you're very stressed, if you're like running more in like a stress state as a, a female, it can be, it can add more stress to like stretch that window out so much. So the cortisol spikes and then you may not feel hungry because your body has a cortisol spike, but you know, it's like a stress spike. And so may not feel hungry and then waiting till one, um, so it can create, but it's also listening to your body. If you're not hungry and you feel good and you don't feel like you're like stressed or having like an anxious state at all in the morning, it may just be yeah, listening to your body, but making sure that you're getting enough nutrients at like one and maybe at like 6 PM. Um, but also for stretching a lot of like the, the intermittent fasting window can also just like for hormones and stuff. It, it depends. Cause a lot of you know, for a lot of men, it's very, it can be like great. But again, for women, it's so nuanced because of the stage you are, if you are postmenopausal, premenopausal, if you are menstruating, if you're not menstruating, if where you are in your cycle, like there's certain times that it's better. And there's certain times where it's actually more detrimental. Again, a lot of it's based on like your, your stress state, your stress levels. And yeah, if you are postmenopausal, it's typically like actually 
better than if you are a minute like a min or if you are a menstruating woman um and so yeah I'm sorry I'm not giving you maybe like a super clear answer no, I, I think it, I think I think you answered I think you know I have to pay more attention because I have been pretty stressed and not knowing why exactly so you know that might have something to do with it I don't know but I can certainly you know pay attention become mindful I think um one of the other questions I had was sometimes and and maybe this is just uh, not a good um resource or whatever but those atkins bars you know like the the chocolate nut things they taste just like snickers almost but they only have like i think three or four grams of sugar and i eat like half a one or maybe they're six grams i eat a half a one and it satisfies it but i just i don't know if that's a bad substitute you know to when you're you know if it's just still um uh, uh what's the word um hitting you know making the sugar craving more or something I don't know yeah well this is such a good question and I wonder so do you feel like but you don't feel like you're overeating it or do you feel like it's causing you are you eating more sugar later um not not typically I I um sometimes you know when I do eat sugar I won't eat that I'll eat sugar <laughs> you know but when I'm trying to you know like not eat so much sugar and I eat one it sort of satisfies you know the craving a little bit but I just didn't know I I haven't really looked at all the ingredients to see how healthy they are but I know they've got a lot of protein in them so I think well that's got to be good <laughs> so yeah and sometimes it's it is just like like that sounds like an up level from a Snickers bar for sure like a up level and it um and I can even look up the ingredients and um but things like that if they're if there's like, if you're not overeating them and you're having that bite and it's feeling like being super present with that and being mindful of it and giving it like, this is like a mindful indulgence of like just eating every bite with intention and then give yourself something after an indulgence. So if you eat something sweet like that, like again, like club soda or hot tea or decaf coffee so that you don't keep eating it or overeat or want more sugar. Cause a lot of times something with sweets, if we're eating it, it can stimulate just more yeah. sugar cravings and wanting to keep eating. And so when we get to that last bite, it's like, I want another, the mind, I want another. So giving, having something to reach for, like to signal that that activity is done and giving your, like, so the post-indulgence ritual is having like tea or decaf coffee okay. or sparkling water, but also just checking in with yourself. That's an, another one where you can start asking yourself, like when you're wanting that Atkins bar, just checking in, what am I feeling right now? What just triggered me to want that Atkins bar? And by no means is this like to judge yourself or shame yourself for just like wanting a little something sweet. Like that is okay. But to to check in, is this an emotional reaction or is it just like, I just want some chocolate? Yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting because really a half of a bar will satisfy me. It's not like I want to eat the whole thing. You know, it's, it's not, it's good, but it's not like something, you know, um, uh, you know, like if I had a piece of, um, or a brownie, you know, I'd probably eat the whole thing and look for another one, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the Atkins bar, I can eat a half and it, you know, it's, it's filling, it's not, you know, but they're not that delicious, but it, 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 uh, that's the trick, I guess, or it satisfies maybe is the word to use. So. Yeah. Well, I think that that sounds like that's working for you. If it's, it's satisfying you and you don't feel like you're sometimes, overeating it. Sometimes it, it doesn't work all the time, but sometimes it does. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. I like the soda or the hot tea or the bone broth. I've been eating bone or drinking bone broth at night too. When I don't want to eat a lot, I'll have like maybe a salad and bone fat, chicken bone broth or something. And that's got a ton of protein in it. And it's so soothing and filling and good. And so I really like that too. Yeah. Oh, Renee, I'm so psyched to hear that you're doing that. That's awesome. Well, I'm doing that, but I'm I'm still eating sugar too. So this has been a great program. I so appreciate you. And I wanted to ask a question. Are you from Denver or do you live in the Denver area? I did. I lived there for about eight months, but I'm actually from Houston. And then I live in Austin. Oh, okay. Because I remember, I'm pretty sure it was you. You came to a Unity Church presentation years ago and saw you in person. And I was so, you did a little presentation about sugar and eating 
several years ago. I don't even remember when it was, but I'm, I don't know if you remember that or not, but. Um, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's so special. I'm so glad to con connect with you again. Yeah. Well, I've gotten your emails over the years and, you know, I, you have tips and, and, uh, you know, I just always, and then when you had this, um, this little workshop, I thought, oh my gosh, I really need to, to do this. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, awesome. I would love to hear if you are willing to share, if you're willing to unmute yourself and just share your biggest takeaway from tonight's session. What are you taking from this workshop? And Lori, are you okay to start? I don't want to throw you on the spot. Um, well, I had heard of the breathing before, so I think the breathing, the, the breath work, Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, th I think the, um, up leveling of snacks or whatever, you know, I like, I liked what you said about the up leveling. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Do you have any questions? No, I mean, I've been involved with a, a functional, um, doctor that is from Denver, <laughs> And so a lot of this just goes right with it, you know. Um, it's it's a lot of the same, and, and I'm hearing it over and over from a lot of different directions. So it's really good. That is so good, Lori. And I think that was something. I'm so glad you said that because I think that was something that helped me so much. Was and it's a it's a great thing to remember. Is like it is like a constant, it's like a reprogramming. So it's constant washing yourself over with this kind of information that can really help with habit yeah. change. Just like continue. I remember I was listening to like every podcast about it, reading about it. It was just like brainwashing myself to really re to see food differently and to like really know how to um, yeah navigate this. So I think that's so awesome. You're working with somebody and that you're- Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've listened, I, today I got on the- uh, a web bar with another functional doctor. And she basically said the same exact thing that the one that I, I'm involved with. Oh. But she said a whole lot of the same things too. So, you know, that's the reinforcement's great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And what about, we'll pass it to Renee. Renee, what's your biggest takeaway? Um. I, what I really liked was the um, self-care and self-compassion, sort of nurturing ourselves. I know, and, and the TV, you know, because I eat in front of the TV all the time, and it's like I live by myself, I'm alone, and and I feel alone a lot of the time, you know, and it's like company or something when I'm watching TV, but I can also do the mindless eating. So I think, I don't know, I've eaten, you know, at the table away from the TV with nothing on, and it just feels so sort of isolating or alone or something. So I don't know. I maybe that is just getting used to that, but um, but also you know somehow nourishing myself, maybe music or something. I don't know. But I um, I like the idea of self care and, and nourishing. I think that was really um, that really hit for me. Mm. Thank you so much, Renee, for that. Awesome. And Terry, would you like to share with us your biggest takeaway? Yeah, there's so many. Um, thank you so much. But I, I, I think, number one, the herbal tea at night, I think um, really caught my attention. And the mindfulness, uh, the two questions, how will I feel after I eat this? Uh, that was a good one. <laughs> That's like really being accountable. Um, but also, you know, the reward of not binge eating or sugar, you know, uploading. Um, and then what am I feeling? Um, you know, another pause is really, really helpful with the breathing. Um, so I'm very grateful. Thank you. This was great. Mm, thank yeah, you so great. much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, y'all are so welcome. I'm so grateful you joined. And I wrote my Instagram and stuff and email and um, would love to connect. If y'all ever have questions, feel free to shoot them over to me. And um, yeah, I look forward to hopefully connecting with you guys in the future. 
Thanks so much. And stay in touch. I love your email. So <laughs> Thank you. All right. Bye. Y'all have a great Thank night. You. Okay, you, you too. too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.